Well, I think a storyteller should be a researcher because uh, we need stories. And it's true that uh, often stories come looking for you, but uh, it's not wise to just wait for them. It's better if you look for stories and there are so many ways to find them. Just listening to other storytellers, asking permission to tell the story, but also if you really are into research, you can find books. And uh, the more languages you know, the easier it is to find uh, good sources. Because uh, it's true, we have Google, we have Wikipedia, everything is translated into English, but it's not that true because some forgotten folk tales of a little small country maybe are just in a French book in a, in a library and if you don't know French, if you don't go to the library, if you stick to the computer, no way to find them. And another way of being a researcher is also going out, meeting people, going to the place where the folk tales maybe have been always told and really living the atmosphere, like when you are telling a story, say, I'm telling often Roman stories of ancient Roman times, and if you don't know how Rome looks or have looked in ancient Roman times, the habits of the people, what they have been eating, or uh, the music, the poetry, the means of transport, it's just that the story is poorer. But if you manage to have this whole dimension, then the story is in three dimensions. It's really huge. We are working with stories that are very old and that come from different, uh, uh, different cultures. And to know something about these stories and to be interested in where they come from, what culture they belong to, what their parallel stories are with the same motives. I think that it's really important for a storyteller to get the broad knowledge of what is the material we are working with. And not only that, but also how do these stories now function nowadays? So when, uh, when I research into stories, what kind of function can they have today? and to spend time on trying to figure out why do I want to tell this story and will it work in a modern context or will it not work in a modern context or how can it raise questions, how can it deal with stereotypes, how can it deal with imagery that is from a patriarchic time and how can this kind of move into my stories. I uh, uh, experienced something very funny when it comes to research. Uh, I personally have never encountered stories that I didn't like. I have encountered stories, of course, that I felt at this moment I don't yet know what this story means or what is so exciting about this story. But I've never rejected stories. Uh, I have met people in classes, outside of classes, who've come to me and said this story is nonsense or it's problematic or I don't like it. This is something that I never understood. I believe that if you're truly interested and curious about stories, then the moment that you, you find stories and you start to research them, you start to read them, you start to compare them, you always eventually find something in the story that speaks to you. And if it doesn't, maybe at that moment for what you want to tell or what you've experienced in your life, you're not ready yet to tell that particular story and that is fine. But this rejection of stories, that's a very weird thing. Um, so. I would say that the research of stories in many ways is connected to the research of who you are and what you are dealing with, what are your questions, what are the things that you want to, you want to say. And those two researchers, they, they find themselves in the middle. I think if you're really interested in stories and you research them and at the same time you keep thinking about yourself, what is now important in my life, this brings you to a point where suddenly there is this explosion of people listening to the story and they're just overwhelmed and they don't even know, is he speaking about his own life? Is he speaking about us? Is he simply giving us a very old story? And yet they will be amazed and this story will have a very deep and lasting impact on them. Well, I think that the storyteller is a craftsman because he or she needs to master a technique like every craftsman who works iron, wood uh, or gold. So who teaches the techniques? It's a master.
exactly like a craftsman, you need to do a period of training. So this is also something that we need in order to master the technique. And uh, we also have a tradition to respect that we learned and uh, uh, push forward. So this is also something that craft masters do. They respect the tradition, but they find also new solution for their skills and uh, technique. Because there is always a development. The shoes of the Roman age is not the shoe. No, the shoe of the Roman age is not uh, the shoe that we are doing today. And the same is for stories, because the customers want new things and they change. So in this way, I think a storyteller is a craftsman. You transmit a story and the way you transmit the story can be very uh, varied and very broad. And what you use, what kind of means you use to transport or to tell the story. So you could look at, uh, let's look at language. Language is one craft area, let's call it that. Where you could look at um, uh, things like uh, poetry, rhyme, rhythm, uh, repetition, alliteration. So it's all elements that actually stem out of oral language that people have been using when there were oral storytellers. And um, uh, in their tradition, when there, there was orality, which was a way to transmit a story that helps audiences to remember the story and latch on to the story. So that would be the language area. You have the voice, which could be very varied, the, the way you use the voice, whether you are high in pitch or low in pitch, loud or soft, or uh, when you go in and out of character, you can use voice as a means. Uh, you've got the body and uh, the, the craft of the body, I mean, 70-80% of communication is body language so it helps to have a, a knowledge of the body what does the body speak how can I um, transmit a story make a story alive by using gestures by using the different kinds of mimicry by using uh, the space it's actually the next area you can use the space to move in a story um, and uh, yeah and then you have uh, the repertoire which actually is also a it's kind of a craft is how what what is your repertoire what kind of stories do you choose to tell what are you interested in what uh, stories um, are the ones you want to bring to the audience so I believe the most basic competences that someone needs to have is to be ident to be able to identify what story that they want to tell to be able to to take it down to its um, basic elements and to find the words to craft the words in which you want to tell it so that the uh, the box in which you're basically presenting your story is very solid and then to have the ability to be free on stage so that you can just give it in whatever way in that moment you feel you can give it and also that the way that you do it is very natural. So it's not that you're telling a story just simply uh, because you've practiced it to be very loud or very quiet, but simply the, the competence, the ability to, to tell it in the way that is needed at that moment when you're in communication with your audience. And this is another thing, you know, many, many times, and I'm not being rude, but many, many times I see a storyteller. Storyteller has a fantastic voice. Storyteller has a fantastic appearance with their clothes. Storyteller knows the story every single pause, 100% perfectly. Their voice is carrying and projecting. They've learned how to breathe, how to assume this place. But I'm watching it and I'm thinking, why am I not in that story with that storyteller? And it took me a few years to figure this out. And this is the, why the conclusion I came to was, it's very simple. I do not believe them. I do not believe them. So they have all the toolkit, but the way that they are telling the story, there is something lacking. And that is the thing, I think that little percentage that is you, that is your personality. You can learn techniques and it's great to learn techniques and learn how to use your voice and how to project and how to tell your story and how to stand and how to use your Alexander technique to breathe and all these kind of things. But it's that part that is you, that is your little light without being too mystical. It's your little light that makes that story either connect, bang, or just sort of disappear up into the heavens, you know? In the storytelling tradition, 
in previous times, if you told stories in a community, the community would know the story. They would uh, have a, that would be a set repertoire in a community. And so the question is, how does every individual teller tell that particular story? How is that transmitted? How does it bring life to the characters and to the scenes and the plot? And the way you rework the story over and over again, or the way one teller takes the story he hears or reads, and how does that person work with that story? Take different motives from other stories or from things he's heard in a different context, and how does it create, he creatively or she creatively reworks the story to make her own version of it? That is an artistic way of working with a with a draft or with a plot of a story that gives you the possibility to really make it your own and that is part of the artistic process of reworking a story that's not so much to do with craft it's much more to do with your own relationship to the story and how you want to tell just this story and how you change it and how you work it and how you build it up and bring it in front of the audience and then of course in the moment you are in front of the audience then the story gets its own life and it might change in the context of the meeting point with the audience the problem for me is when someone goes on stage and the only reason for him or her to go on stage is because they want to be on stage and they use the story for that so that's not an artist for me so an artist for me is someone that asks a question about life explores it and really wants to investigate and convey it with a public and that becomes an urge and the story is an excuse for that so there is a question so asking questions for sure like I would say is very important Well, as storytelling is a dialogue in the context of the telling situation, it's not the fourth wall of the actor, it's not a still image, it's not something that you, you just kind of look at and take away. It's, um, it is a moment in the here and now situation. And so I am telling you a story but you and your energy gives me something back and you respond maybe through the way you look or the way you move. And so a performer, because it's here and now, will always be in a situation where things are happening in the space. I'm not just delivering something, but it will be changing in the moment of our meeting point or the specific audience that is sitting in the room just that moment. And that's the performer's work to be open to that, to be willing, to be communicating with the audience, to be um, uh, willing to change maybe in a situation, maybe there's a comment and I need to react to that. Maybe someone is going out and I need to react to that. And maybe I have to ignore it. I mean, sometimes if you put focus on someone who's really um, disruptive, then it could be even worse. So the performer is in the moment, present in the moment, in his story, but at the same time, he is in the context of telling the story. How do you teach somebody confidence is, uh, is something, the answer that people have been searching for, for, for since time began, you know? But it's a really interesting thing because people think that many, many storytellers are on stage and they, have, and they, are, and they are confident and in control. But in my experience, not as a, just as a performer, but also as a festival organiser, is that many people are not feeling that way they're projecting that but they are terrified or or they get nervous or they even get ill you know like make themselves like sort of nauseous before a show so it's it's overcoming the confidence when i work with students i just say to them i say it's like it's very simple it's like if you have a car if you don't have petrol in that car you can't go anywhere you're stuck and stage fright can do this to you you know if you're if you're nervous so you have to learn to turn those nerves and that energy which is what it is into fuel First of all, just a storyteller alone with the audience is already a team player. Because if you establish the good relationship with the audience, there are no sides. You are a team and you are building the story and living the story. So this is the first kind of uh, teamwork, the basis. But then you can work with another storyteller or with a musician or with both. And then what happens is, especially with music, 
it's another language. So all of a sudden there are two voices that can interact, do a dialogue, but also do solos. And music, for example, is really powerful because if you just put away the storyteller for a while, just music alone is so evocative. It can paint landscapes in just a few notes. So this is also a work of listening, giving space to the other, and it's uh, a work that I would love to study more and train more. And what we saw is that many storytellers, because they don't get on stage um, uh, usually with more than one person, even when, for instance, they will bring uh, a musician, still you feel the storyteller is standing there alone, has no ability to really engage in, in exciting communication with the person sitting or standing next to them. Um, and then especially when then finally they decide to bring in one or more storytellers on stage, it becomes, it stays kind of artificial. Now with our friend we realized that um, this is something that has to be introduced. So there is a lot of exercises that you can do which is simply about feeling where the other people are on stage. Um, so that even when you don't see them, you're aware not just of the audience in front of you, but there is another interesting human being breathing, living next to you. And they don't only exist when they're speaking or it's not that you disappear when you stop speaking. So to develop this a little bit. So of course, sometimes you can go on stage and you can be me audience. And already then it's team player, if you're a good storyteller. Because if you're just telling your story and you don't care what's happening there, that's not gonna work. So you have to be sensitive. That's already teamwork because I let the audience in and let it affect the way I tell the story. But apart from that, there is enormous uh, 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 amount of opportunities that can be like, for example, the work me and my colleague do. We are uh, kind of moving between a dramatic line of an entire piece that is using stories. So we have a relationship between us that transforms during the play. The audience watches that. And at the same time, we tell stories to the audience. So it becomes a more complex structure that uh, uses a lot of storytelling. But at the same time, there is a bigger story above all the stories that are being told. And for that, you need to be able to work in a team. Well, it would be nice if you just uh, could step on the stage and tell stories, but it's not true. Because first, you need to convince someone that you are able to tell stories. So you need uh, to, to do promotion, to know what you are doing, and to be able to communicate it clearly. Why should someone choose you and not another storyteller? Why are you special? What can you do that others cannot? What is your uh, speciality, uh, your repertoire, your way of telling? This is always something that uh, you should have in mind. So who you are, why are you special? This is the first thing, knowing about yourself and how to present yourself. Also uh, in a visual way, like not uh, just writing and doing emails, but the way you speak to the people, the way you are there uh, meeting, uh, showing interests in everybody. It's, I mean, you need to be open for this profession, I think. If you just go, you will lose everything that happens on the sides. What else? Knowing something about economy, like really the bureaucratic part of the job because uh, often the training is focused on art, but then uh, we are doing everything as a storyteller, and so all of a sudden you realize you don't know how to do a bill, an invoice, or something like that, and this is also something that you need. Social media, promotion, uh, and also constantly. You can't disappear for months. Maybe you can put uh, on Facebook something of someone else, another show that you liked, but always try to speak of storytelling, even if you are not uh, ready with a show, speaking about what you are uh, working at, it's good. Instagram and uh, just being uh, aware that uh, there is another scene, that it's not reality, it's multimedia, it's internet, but it's as important to reach the goal. As I'm very passionate about storytellers, a professionalizing their, their their business, because if we as a community 
do not take ourselves seriously, how can we expect anybody else to take, serious, uh, take us seriously? You know, so I, it's a very, it's a high passion of mine that we need to raise our act. And the interesting thing is the storytellers that are successful and busy and working, they are the ones who know the value of good publicity, of good promotion, of seeing business opportunities, you know? Uh, so yeah, I'm very passionate about this.